Hello everyone and welcome back to Katha by Shraddha. Today we bring you a story by Katie Bagley that was recently published by the Bombay Natural History Society. This book, Flight of the Pink-Headed Ducks and Other Stories, it's actually a collection of short stories about rare animals of the Indian subcontinent that have been threatened and that are impacted by our actions, our human actions. So today I would love to read to you the story called the return of the great Indian Buster. Young Hansa sat up in bed, rubbing the sleep from her eyes. It was the brilliant radiance of the moon that had woken her up. She peered through the little window of the attic that served as her bedroom. The moon shone in all its glory. It was the largest full moon she had ever seen. Its glow lit up the ripe crops in the fields, making them appear silvery white. All around, Kasoli village wore a mystical look. This, Hansa thought, must be the harvest moon she had heard the village elders talk about. This super large full moon is very rare. It appears once in many years, she had overheard them say and it always coincides with the harvest season. Hansa, excited by what she beheld, ran down the wooden stairs to wake up her parents. But they were already aware of it. Her father, in fact, was not even in the house. Your father wished to join the village elders who had gathered under the old Rohida tree, Hansa's mother told her. The girl's eyes went to the empty corner of the room where her father's large drum normally lay. He has taken his drum with him, her mother informed her. The men are celebrating this special night with music and song. I too would like to join them, cried Hansa. But your father is out with the other elders of the village. There is no one as small as you in that crowd. Then I will climb onto the roof of Harini's house and watch them. Even as Hansa was climbing onto the roof, the songs accompanied by drums, flute and madga, which is a pot made of special clay with brass shards mixed in it and serves as a percussion instrument. The madga also began floating out of the silence of the night. They were songs in praise of nature and all her glory. The men swayed and danced in rhythm to the music as if they were in a trance. For Hansa, it was a bewitching experience. As she listened from the rooftop, she heard something else that made her prick up her ears. It was another deep, resonating sound that came not from the Rohida tree where her father and others had gathered, but from somewhere far, getting louder every minute, as if whoever was producing the sound was walking towards their village. It struck her like a flash of lightning. It was the deep booming of the great Indian bustard. Hansa couldn't stop herself from screaming at the top of her voice. It's the great Indian bustard. The musical ensemble stopped when they heard her cry out. Everyone held their breath as a stately male bird stepped out of a shrub. He was large larger than any of the bustards the villagers had ever seen. He had stopped calling now, but Hansa could still hear a soft metallic tinkling sound as he strutted about. He was perfectly at ease and didn't seem to mind everyone staring at him. She strained her eyes to look at the bird's legs, which were half hidden in the grass. But then he hopped onto a rock, bringing himself into full view. Hansa could now see the bird clearly. Her heart skipped several beats. It was Gagan Bhair. The story actually began three years ago when Hansa was just about nine years old. She was picking blackberries from the Karwanda bushes as she did every day in summer and singing to herself when she saw a pair of large birds land in their field. She had never seen birds of this size before and ran into her house to tell her parents about them. Hansa's parents were ecstatic 
on seeing them. They are the great Indian bustards, her father Harith cried, clapping his hands in joy and dancing about like a child. You see, you see that larger one with the black crown? He is the male and the other lighter, duller one is the female. The males are great show-offs. How come I've never seen them before? asked Hansa. They used to be around when your father and I were your age, said Rupa Bai, Hansa's mother. Back then, there were more grasslands than fields. But when people began burning down the grass to make way for the plough, the birds disappeared. The three of them watched amused as the birds began nibbling on their crops. After all, they do need to eat. What's more, they will also gobble up the grasshoppers, the beetles and bugs that feed on our plants. So they will keep our fields free from such pests. I do hope the birds are here to stay. I consider the great Indian bustard as a lucky mascot. Rupabai hastened to where the picture frame of Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, hung in their house and lit incense sticks on a brass stand next to it as a form of thanksgiving for sending these lucky birds back to their land. But Bhogilal, another farmer who lived a short distance away with his wife, did not think similarly. He could not bear the thought of any creature helping itself to his crops. Bhogilal was the only farmer in the village who had somehow made his pile and was wealthy. The rest of them led simple lives, earning just enough for their bread and butter. Bhogilal and his wife looked down upon the other villagers with scorn. Wealth had gone to their heads. They kept to themselves, believing that they had to maintain their status and refused to mingle with the others. The man could afford to buy tractors and automatic sprinklers for his fields, so he did not have to exert himself like the others. He would lavishly spray pesticides to make sure that his crops were not eaten up by insects. Every few months, he would buy sacks of chemical fertilizers to add to his soil. As a result, his fields were always bursting at the seams with abundant crops. You know, but little did he realize that he would not be able to sustain this kind of farming for long. It did not occur to him that he was slowly but surely poisoning his soil with harsh chemicals. That fool Harith is entertaining those birds out there. Doesn't he realize that we will soon see his field bare? He said one day to his wife, twirling the ends of his long pointed moustache. I don't want him coming here begging for food from me once his field is wiped out by those bustards. Why don't you warn him? suggested his wife, rocking herself on the swing in the veranda of their house. You think that will have any effect? He doesn't have an ounce of sense in that head of his. All day I see him and his family gazing at those birds, frolicking about as if they are in a hypnotic trance. Indeed, it was courtship time for the great Indian bustards and the male bustard would put up the most spectacular display to impress his female partner. He would come closer and closer, booming all the while until he stepped out of the grass and was in full view. He would then begin his show, erecting his black crown feathers, stretching his long white neck and turning his head skywards. The dance would reach its climax when with wings fluffed out and tail cocked up, he would inflate the enormous yellow gular, a sack-like skin wobbling from his throat like a balloon and call out loudly, boom, 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 as though he had reached the finale. The female great Indian bustard would watch the male, half hidden among the stalks of maize. The birds arrived early, every day at the crack of dawn and flew away at sunset. Where to? Nobody knew. This fascinating courtship display would be performed again and again and again every day with a few variations. The stunning dance had bewitched Hansa, her parents and in fact all the people in the village who often came by to watch. Sometimes when the birds decided to take a break from their avian show, Hansa would try to approach them. 
But as soon as she came within a few yards, they would run and take to the air just like an airplane on the runway. Hansa and her parents knew that Bhogilal would not tolerate the great Indian bustards if they visited his fields. So whenever they caught sight of the birds heading towards their rich neighbor's land, they would brandish a long bamboo at the birds and chase them back to their own field. One fateful morning, the sky was overcast with clouds, dimming the light of the rising sun. As it was still dark, Hansa and her parents were asleep. But the great Indian bustards had arrived as usual. Instead of choosing their usual destination, they descended upon Bhogilal's fields, where the grand crop was ripe. Bhogilal's old dog raised an alarm by barking loudly. When Bhogilal saw the birds helping themselves to his precious gram crop, he was filled with rage. He ran into the house and got his crude gun. Bang, bang! He fired blindly. The explosive sound jarred the morning air and echoed from the fields. Fortunately, both the bullets had just scraped the birds, leaving them without any injury. But they were so terrified that they began honking in distress and with a frenzied flapping of wings they made off vanishing into the grey clouds of gloom. They were never to be seen again after that. By now, everyone in the village was awake and they were filled with shock, horror and disgust. They all stood in a circle around Bhogilal's house, anger brimming on their faces. Seeing so many furious faces, Bhogilal was scared. Look, I, I haven't killed the birds. I have only frightened them away from my f fields. He stuttered and went into his house, shutting the door on them. With the birds gone, Hansa and her parents felt a deep sense of loss. At least they are around to see the light of day, Harit reconciled. They are probably in some other green pasture, enjoying life. Two weeks after the great Indian bustards had disappeared, the cloud of despair that had surrounded Hansa melted away when a soft chee-chee, chee-chee sound from somewhere on the ground came floating to her ears. It was the most pleasant surprise of her life. Stopping dead in her tracks, she bent down and brushed aside the stalks of maize. Looking very lost and confused was a downy feathered chick. Its colors blended perfectly with the surroundings and lying next to this adorable chick was a mud colored broken eggshell. said to the chick, picking it up very delicately as if it were made of glass. And then it struck her. This was the baby of the great Indian bustards. Her heart began to sing with joy and she ran home with the cottony soft chick cradled in her arms. We can't leave this motherless chick out in the open and expect it to fend for itself, Harith remarked. We will raise it here in our house. After all, we owe this to its parents who were chased away from Kasoli. The bustard chick became part of Hansa's household. They named it. Can you guess? Yes, they named it Gaganbhel, which means thunder-like sound, as a memory of the bird that had visited them. Every day Hansa would hunt for caterpillars and worms, these she would squash and feed the baby chick. Gaganbher had a large appetite and kept Hansa very busy. By now, Hansa and her parents had figured out that the chick was a male. As he grew bigger, the worms Hansa fed him were inadequate. So his diet was supplemented with other things like maize and millet seeds. One day, on a sudden whim, Hansa removed the silver anklets she had been wearing and put them on Gagan Bhair's long legs. He seemed to like them and strutted about, enjoying the tinkling sounds of the little bells on the anklets. <laughs> he is quite an entertainer, just like his father, remarked Rupa Bai, laughing. Soon Gagan Bhair learned to fly. 
but Hansa would never let him out of her sight. She was afraid that he may stray into Bhogilal's fields. The young bird would respond when she called out his name. As soon as the sun set and it turned dark, Gaganbher would walk to the corner of the room where Hansa had made a soft bed of straw for him. And here he would sleep soundly all through the night, just like a baby in its cot. Strange as it may seem that year, Harith had an exceptionally good harvest. Whether it was because the bustards had been eating up the plant pests in his field or they had brought him good fortune, he was not sure. Ironically, Bhogilal's fields bore a dismal yield. For Hansa and her parents, the days that followed couldn't have been happier. But little did they know that there was danger lurking around the corner. Unknown to them, a wolf had been on the prowl for the past few days. The she-wolf was hungry and so were her cubs. She had eyed the chick, Gaganbher. But every time she attempted to get hold of the little buster, Hansa or one of her parents would be around and the wolf, being shy of humans, would warily dunk back into the bushes. As spring gave way to summer, it became excessively hot. One night, Harith left the door of their house ajar so that the air from outside would bring some relief. The wolf, now desperate to feed her starving cubs and to satisfy her own gnawing pangs of hunger, saw her chance. She stole into the house while they were all asleep and grabbed Gaganbher with her teeth. The bird cried out in alarm, waking up Hansa's household, and they ran out with sticks, utensils, whatever they could get hold of. But the wolf and Gaganbher had vanished into the darkness. They fetched their kerosene lamp and searched everywhere through all the night, but in vain. Gaganbher was nowhere to be seen. Finally, they gave up, resigning to the fact that the hungry wolf had made a meal of their pet bird. But they felt a deep, dark void in their lives. Time slipped by, like it always does. Days turned into months and months into years. And on that glorious night of the harvest moon, as everyone gathered around the large great Indian bustard, Hansa caught sight of the glimmer of silver around the bird's legs. She cried out excitedly, It's Gaganbher! It's Gaganbher! Gaganbher has returned! Look! Look! He's still wearing my anklets! Indeed, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, Gaganbher had arrived that night after three long years. He had not been eaten up by the wolf after all. Everyone began talking at once, exchanging their views and expressing their wonder at this great miracle. As they spoke, a shadow seemed to block out the moonlight briefly and all eyes turned to that direction. They could hear the flapping of wings. Two birds landed right next to Gaganbher. Look, Gaganbher has brought his two companions with him too, cried Hansa excitedly. The villagers were abuzz with excitement. Their long lost friend had returned with company. Friends, we must make sure that the birds never stray onto Bhogilal's land if we want them to stay, cautioned Hansa's father. No way. The birds will stray onto Bhogilal's land. They are free to roam wherever they please. A voice spoke from the darkness. It was Bhogilal. He had uttered those words. He stepped out of the shadows and the crowd, the crowd gasped at the sight of him. They could barely recognize him. He seemed to have grown very old, hunchbacked and walking with the help of a stick, his clothes hanging loose now on his skinny frame. His long pointed moustache looked scraggly and drooped limply. He looked very sad. My fields have been doing very poorly of late, as you all know. In any case, I do not need any more money. I have made enough of it. It hasn't brought me happiness. I have decided to leave my fields to the elements. Let the wild grasses grow and let the bustards roam on my land. 
even as the villagers were trying to digest this incredible piece of news, Gagandhir surprised everybody by flying into Bhogilal's territory and plopping her down on his field. He inflated his gular and boom, 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 he called, performing a kind of ballet, pirouetting, twirling, spinning, making a stunning spectacle against the backdrop of the super moon which had now turned golden. Why don't you all come over to my place? Bhogilal spoke once again. I shall tell my Maharaj, his chef, to churn up some delicious snacks. His khoba rotis and kachoris are excellent. We will make merry to celebrate the return of our lucky mascots. The night was magical for the people of Kasoli. They returned to their drums, dance and song. I wish this night never ends, said Hansa, to no one in particular. But it did end, when at last the harvest moon melted into the semi-darkness of dawn. And they headed home, tired but immensely happy. By and by, in the days that followed, Harit and many of the other villagers also gave up farming to convert their fields into grasslands. They took up other means to earn their bread and butter. Some began weaving carpets, others learned to do block printing. The women embroidered saris with motifs of the great Indian bustards. Still others made clay effigies of the bird. Much to their heart's delight, the birds multiplied and Kasoli Hamlet transformed into a bustard sanctuary, drawing tourists from far and wide. The years rolled by and eventually Gagandhir and his companions took another journey, this time to Bustard Heaven. But there still stands in the village square a large statue of Gagandhir with silver anklets on his legs. His memory remains immortal. Wasn't that a beautiful tale? At the end of each of these short stories, there is a little block of information about each of these rare animals that the stories are about. I love this book and I'm so thankful to Katie Bagley as well as Bombay Natural History Society for giving me permission to read this story to you on Katha by Shraddha. I hope you enjoyed the telling of this story just as much as I enjoyed telling it to you. Again, the book is called Flight of the Pink-Headed Ducks and Other Stories by Katie Bagley and published by BNHS. It was great seeing you all again on this platform. See you soon. Bye. I am so happy to share the fact that it is through this book that I was long listed as Best Children's Author for the Author Awards, a joint venture between Times of India and GK Papers Limited. And I am really thrilled to be showcasing this book on Katha.